Hello and welcome to Socialism, the Marxist podcast from the Socialist Party. How did Trotsky view the relationship between the revolution and its party? Where countless other revolutions have failed, the workers of Russia succeeded in taking power in October 1917. The decisive factor was the Bolshevik party. Leon Trotsky likened it to a piston box which could channel the steam of mass revolutionary energy. Trotsky did not start out as a member of the Bolsheviks, but he came to see the role Lenin had played in preparing an organisation capable of leading the working class during revolutionary upheavals as vital. But are the Bolsheviks a model for building a party today? What is the difference between a broad workers' party and a revolutionary party? And is a revolutionary party all we need to make a successful revolution? This episode of Socialism looks at political consciousness and organisation. Trotsky and the Revolutionary Party. As a political leader, Leon Trotsky is very closely associated with the Bolshevik Party, which Mm -hmm. is really the first successful revolutionary party on the planet. So this episode we're going to be examining as part of our series on Trotsky and Trotskyism, Trotsky and the Revolutionary Party. We've got here today Hannah Sell. Hello, Hannah. Hi. Who is the General Secretary of the Socialist Party. Our first question is, how did Trotsky see the relationship between a revolution and a revolutionary party? Okay. I mean, obviously, this is on a specific topic, but there's a background to it, Mm -hmm. which we don't have time to go into today. But like us, Trotsky believed that we live in a class society, specifically a capitalist society, and that society is dominated by a tiny minority, an extremely powerful elite who own the means of production. Industry, science, technique is under their control. Mm -hmm. Some capitalist countries are dictatorships. Others, like Britain, are democracies. Mm -hmm. But even in a capitalist democracy... Actually, it is an extremely truncated form of democracy. And the vast majority of the population have very limited power over their own lives, never mind over society as a whole. And what's needed is a fundamental transformation of society, a revolution in which the working class, which are the majority in a country like Britain, they weren't in Russia in 1917, Mm -hmm. but because of their key role in industry, Mm -hmm. working together collectively, they're key in fighting to transform society, which requires the nationalisation of those major corporations and banks that dominate the economy to begin to build a socialist planned economy. So when he talks about a revolution and when we talk about a revolution, that's what we're talking about. The working class taking power. Absolutely, yes. And Trotsky, in the preface to his masterpiece, The History of the Russian Revolution, a great big book all about what took place in the Russian Revolution, sums up a revolution as being the direct interference of the masses into historical events. And he explains how, at crucial moments, when the old order becomes no longer endurable to the masses, they break the barriers excluding them from the political arena, sweep aside their traditional representatives and create by their own interference the initial groundwork for a new regime. Mm. So that's a description in broad terms of a revolution in which the working class have the key role to play, but other sections of the oppressed masses also participate. But he thought a revolutionary party had a key role to play in that process. So in the same introduction, he describes a revolutionary party as constituting not an independent but nevertheless a very important element in the process. And he says, without a guiding organisation, the energy of the masses would dissipate like steam not enclosed in a piston box. But nevertheless, what moves things is not the piston or the box, but the steam. And that's a very basic idea for us. Revolutionary parties do not create revolutions, but they are an absolutely essential prerequisite for the working class taking and consolidating power. Mm -hmm. And... Trotsky there is, to some extent, correcting Lenin. Okay. But Lenin from 1901, and Lenin himself corrected himself. (laughs) He would have agreed completely with what Trotsky wrote there. But 
in his 1901 pamphlet, What is to be Done, which is an excellent pamphlet, it's mm. well worth reading, but it goes a bit far in giving the idea that socialism can only initially be brought to the working class from the outside. This is Lenin saying this. This is Lenin saying this by the revolutionary intelligentsia, mm. the more educated layers of society. Now, of course, he's writing in a time in a country where the working class is extremely poor and oppressed, often illiterate, so you can understand where he's coming from but it was one-sided it's not the case and actually if you look at the 1917 revolution the Bolshevik party a revolutionary party were essential to its success but the Bolsheviks didn't just sit in a study somewhere and come up with a correct program which Mm. they then gave to the masses (laughs) on the contrary the masses had moved in the direction of socialist ideas on the basis of their own experience. And the Bolsheviks programme was developed in an interrelationship, a living, dynamic relationship with the struggle itself. So to give an example of that, you take the idea of Soviets, which were workers' committees that organised the struggle but also in 1917 became the basis for developing a new, more democratic society, they weren't thought of by the Bolsheviks. Mm. They came up spontaneously in the 1905 earlier revolution, and actually some of the Bolsheviks didn't initially recognise their importance, Trotsky did, but it was Lenin and Trotsky who understood their significance and the role that they could play in 1917. So that's a bit of an example of how a revolutionary party's programme develops as part of the struggle of the working class, not something separate to it. Even without a revolutionary party, the working class will develop socialist ideas. Mm. So then why do you need it? Why is a party necessary? Good question. The capitalist class have maintained power for centuries by playing on the many divisions in the working class. Like I said earlier, in a country like Britain, the working class are a big majority in society. Mm. And the capitalist class today, even more than at the time of the Russian Revolution, are a tiny, tiny minority. So how do they manage to have all this wealth and power? Well, one of the means that they use is divide and rule, of Mm -hmm. playing off public and private sector workers, workers who were born in this country and workers who've come from abroad, young and old, all the different layers and divisions that exist. And a revolutionary party and its programme is designed to overcome those divisions, to unite the working class in common objectives, in the struggle against capitalism and pointing towards a socialist alternative for the problems of every section of the working class. And Trotsky makes the point that that is different to... Previous revolutions, capitalist revolutions, because, of course, these days, with their power thoroughly ensconced, the capitalists are horrified at the idea of revolution. (laughs) But their dominance came via revolutions, the English Civil War, Mm. the French Revolution. The American War of Independence. Absolutely, yes. But they didn't need a revolutionary party. And Trotsky explains that. He says... The proletariat cannot seize power by a spontaneous uprising. Even in highly industrialised and cultured Germany, which was, you know, a very developed economic capitalist country at the time, the spontaneous uprising of the toilers in November 1918 only succeeded in transferring power to the hands of the bourgeoisie. One property class is able to seize the power they've wrested from another because it's able to base itself upon its riches, its cultural level and its innumerable connections with the old state apparatus. But the proletariat has no substitute for its own party. So it's Mm. different. One section, an upcoming section of an elite taking the power and the mass, the working class taking the power, which is what we're discussing about. And for that, you need a revolutionary party. But Trotsky, in fact, wasn't a member of the Bolshevik party Uh, at least at the start of 1917, was he? No, he wasn't. In fact, he didn't formally join until quite a long way through 1917. And he fully recognised that it was Lenin who had played the key role in the creation and stealing of the Bolshevik Party in the years before 1917. And that provided the framework for building, in the course of the revolution, a mass party capable of leading the struggle for power. It's kind of the pre-history, the pre-pre-history. But Trotsky had parted from Lenin in 1903. And that was during a split which developed. It was unexpected on all sides, actually, at the Second Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, the RSDLP. And it was a split into two factions, the Bolsheviks, which actually just means the majority, they were like the harder faction, and the softer Mensheviks, the minority. And at that stage, it appeared to be on secondary organisational issues. 
It wasn't, actually. Underlying those were fundamental differences which were then played out in the years that followed. And Trotsky had considered himself close to Lenin, was politically much closer to Lenin, but he found himself in the opposite camp. And he himself, he describes that in his autobiography, My Life, where he says that his disagreement with Lenin appeared to be over personal or moral issues. But then he says at bottom, the separation was of a political nature and merely expressed itself in the realm of organisational methods. He says, I thought of myself as a centralist. But there is no doubt at the time I did not fully realise what an intense and imperious centralism the Revolutionary Party would need to lead millions of people in a war against the old order. Mm. So he's saying there he didn't fully understand what was necessary and that's how he ended up on a different side to Lenin in that dispute. And could you perhaps just explain what is meant by centralism then? Absolutely, because that's a very important question. Trotsky is talking about the methods of democratic centralism, which is the method by which a Revolutionary Party organises. But it has also been slandered because democratic centralism and particularly the centralist, the imperial centralism that Trotsky talks about has been falsely associated with Stalinism, with the brutal dictatorships which later developed in the Soviet Union and large parts of Eastern Europe totally ignoring the fact that Stalin was only able to come to power over the murdered bodies and the blood of the old Bolsheviks Mm -hmm. who had led the revolution. But the Bolshevik party was based on democratic centralism and that had nothing in common with Stalinism. On the contrary, it was the most democratic mass party in history. What does democratic centralism mean? Trotsky talked about a revolutionary party needing to have a mobile balance between democracy on the one hand and centralism on the other, and that balance alters depending on the circumstances. Mm -hmm. So, for example, it's undoubtedly true that in the periods that the Bolshevik Party were having to work in the underground, in a dictatorship under Tsarism, Mm. centralism had to be emphasised for necessity of safety. There was no option but to do that. But at the same time, the democratic side is of enormous importance. Mm. And at different periods... In the revolutionary upsurges in 1905 and again in 1917, democracy was dominant. An enormous democratic debate and discussion took place on different issues. The basic idea, though, is you discuss and you debate and you take a decision and then you implement it. And in that sense, an element of democratic centralism is present in every worker's struggle because you have a vote on whether to go out on strike But a strike is not effective if the attitude of the members of the trade union is, it doesn't matter how I vote, it doesn't matter what the result is, I'm not going to go on strike because I didn't vote for it. (laughs) You know, a majority vote to strike, you go on strike. Turns out the strike's a mistake, you might assess that afterwards and decide not to do it again. Mm. But you act together and that really is the basic idea of democratic centralism. And its starting point is political, is programmatic the need for a fundamental transformation of society. And that's your beginning point and your organisational methods, if you like, flow from that. Now, going back to 1903, Trotsky understood the need for a revolutionary party organised on that basis. It wasn't that he disagreed with Lenin about that, Mm. but he still hoped for reconciliation with the Mensheviks. He thought that they would shift under the pressure of a mass movement and would move back to the left, effectively. And really, that's what led to his, as he himself called it, his conciliationism at that point in time. He wasn't linked to the Mensheviks for very long at all. He then spent months arguing with them because, of course, once freed from the firm, clear political position of the Bolsheviks, a lot of them moved rapidly to the right Mm. in reality. So he argued with them and he broke with them, but he was only reunited with Lenin and the Bolsheviks in the course of 1917. However, in the course of the Russian Revolution, if you like the second Russian Revolution, as it unfolded after February and the overthrow of the Tsar, Trotsky and Lenin were in complete agreement on all of the central tasks facing the working class. Trotsky didn't actually formally join until late July, but he was working completely as one with the Bolsheviks in the period before that. So you could say, well, does it actually matter that they built a revolutionary party, because after all, Trotsky came in and played a key role, having played no part in it for the Mm. previous 12 years. No longer. (laughs) Can't add up. (laughs) 14. 14, yeah. But actually, Trotsky was 
politically clear. He was utterly determined. He had big authority because he'd been the president of the St. Petersburg Soviet during the 1905 revolution. But he would have faced enormous difficulties trying to forge a party in the heat of the revolution Mm. if the groundwork hadn't already been laid. And Lenin would have faced the same difficulties, but he'd laid the groundwork with the building of the Bolshevik party over the previous period. And their authority was based on everything they'd done before. If you like, they'd done what Marx and Engels talk about in the Communist Manifesto, which is summing up, if you want, the role of a revolutionary party, which is fighting for the attainment of the immediate aims of the working class, for the enforcement of their momentary interests, but in the movement of the present, also representing the future of that movement. Mm -hmm. So the Bolsheviks had authority because they were hard fighters for the immediate aims of the working class. In 1912, when the definitive break with the Mensheviks came, although even up till 1917 in some remote provinces, they were still meeting together. But nonetheless, the formal definitive break came in 1912. At that stage, the Bolsheviks had the support of four fifths of the organised working class in Russia. So they had a powerful position, which then enabled them to play the role that they did in the revolution. So that was Russia in the early 20th Mm. century Can we really take the Bolsheviks as a model for building a party today? So, in fundamentals, in essence, yes. Okay. I mean, after all, they successfully broke with capitalism and there were specific things about the Bolshevik party that enabled them to do that. But, of course, they weren't some kind of ahistorical, abstractly perfect party. (laughs) Um, And, for example, and this is not an unimportant example... Without the return of Lenin to Russia, who got back before Trotsky, its leadership were on course to become just the left wing of the Menshevik party. They were really following along the same path. So, tr- of supporting the capitalist government. Yes, absolutely, yeah. That wasn't the instinct of the worker Bolsheviks, mm. but it was what the majority of the leadership were doing before Lenin returned. I'll quote Trotsky again, because he can put it better than I can. So in the class, the party and the leadership, which was actually an unfinished article, but it sums it up well. He says the arrival of Lenin in Petrograd on April the 3rd, 1917, turned to the Bolshevik party in time and enabled the party to lead the revolution to victory. Our sages might say that had Lenin died abroad at the beginning of 1917, the October Revolution would have taken place just the same. But that is not so. Lenin represented one of the living elements of the historical process. He personified the experience and the perspicacity, I cannot say that word. Perspicacity. Thank you, of the most active section of the proletariat. His timely appearance on the arena of the revolution was necessary in order to mobilise the vanguard and provide it with an opportunity to rally the working class and peasant masses. Political leadership in the crucial historical turns can become just as decisive a factor as is the role of the chief command during the critical moments of war. History is not an automatic process. Otherwise, why leaders? Why parties? Why programmes? Why theoretical struggles? So he was not arguing that Lenin as an individual without the existence of the Bolsheviks would have been sufficient. In the same article, he explains that for Lenin's slogans to find their ways to the masses, there had to exist cadres. And by that, he means experienced party activists who've got roots in the working class. Mm -hmm. And he says, even though numerically small at the beginning, there had to exist the confidence of the cadres in the leadership, a confidence based on the entire experience of the past. To cancel these elements from one's calculations is simply to ignore the living revolution. So the Bolsheviks had authority in the working class. Lenin had authority with the cadre of the Bolsheviks, and he was able to turn them in a correct political direction in time. But of course, it's a weakness that it relied on Lenin and Mm. Trotsky coming from the outside of the Bolshevik party. A stronger revolutionary party would have had far more individuals who were capable of playing that role. So it's not some ahistorical perfect model. But nonetheless, it's not just the positive example of 1917. It's the negative examples that followed. It's the fact that there were a wave of revolutions in the wake of October. But Germany, Italy, numerous other countries... The working class showed their heroism and their determination to overthrow capitalism. But the one thing that was lacking was, if you like, parties of a Bolshevik type. 
the Bolshevik Party, now the Communist Party, founded the Communist International and desperately tried to build such parties on an international basis. But they were made up of inexperienced, disparate elements who hadn't yet been steeled in struggle. And had they existed in the way the Bolshevik Party existed, history would have been entirely different. And we would have been discussing how to build a communist society, not fighting to overturn the existing <laughs> capitalist order. Mm. So, you know, you need a revolutionary party... I would recommend particularly, even more than reading the history of the Russian Revolution and the Bolsheviks, although of course that's vital, mm. read the writings of Trotsky and Lenin when they're trying to arm the young communist international in the years after 1917 and explain to them the methods that the Bolshevik party used. It's a kind of synthesis of all the experience of the previous decades and how to apply them to the situation that was faced then and I'm enormously valuable for us today as well. I mean, of course, that doesn't mean you can just pick up a quote by Lenin or Trotsky and say, they said this, so I'm right in this situation today. Mm. Because building a revolutionary party is a very complex, multifaceted task. And actually what you've got to understand is their method. Different things were necessary at different stages. Even reading those writings of the five years after 1917, the first five years of the Communist International, that is not the same at every stage. At the very beginning, it seemed like a disorientated capitalism coming out of the First World War could be overthrown in the wake of the October Revolution by spontaneous uprisings of the working class. That didn't succeed. The capitalist class regained the initiative, particularly using the leaders of social democracy. Mm, to, the reformist workers' party. Absolutely, yeah, to spearhead the counter-revolution. That's the reality. But that led to a new situation where longer-term tasks were posed of building mass communist parties, gaining roots and authority in the working class, of adopting tactics like the United Front, which were aimed at showing in practice, in living struggle, the superiority of the Communist Party to the old social democratic parties, the mass reformist parties, which still had the support of millions of workers at this stage. Mm. So, you know, they were fighting against ultra-left impatience and opportunist tendency to go along with the existing order. And at each stage, the concrete tasks that were proposed were different. It's enormously rich for us today, but you have to apply it to the concrete situation. So, in order to have a revolution today, do we just need to build a revolutionary party? Is that it? Look, we definitely should build a revolutionary party <laughs> and a revolutionary international. It's extremely important, crucial, but of course it's not so simple. I mean, like we were discussing at the beginning, no revolutionary party can create a revolution. Mass struggle has its own dynamic. The point at which the masses think we can't put up with this anymore, we've got to enter the scene of history and try and change things, can't be determined by a revolutionary party. Mm. So what you have to look at is what kind of period we're living in today, what opportunities there's going to be to change society and what tasks we face. And we've had in the Committee for Workers International, our international organisation, a debate on some of the same issues. There are echoes of the debates that took place in the early years of the Communist International. Just last year, as you know, we had a big international debate which led to splits. We've mm -hmm. come out of it politically much strengthened. So it's been a positive experience, but not without pain, not without losses. We lost a layer who collapsed in an opportunist direction. That's the reality. They would still claim to adhere to Trotskyism, but it really have adapted to the existing consciousness of, if you like, the radical middle classes mm. and are moving away from basing themselves on the centrality of the working class in the struggle for socialism. So that's one side. But we also had a small group who did just reduce it, really, to a question of fighting for socialism means building a revolutionary party. And that's the only factor in the situation. But a revolutionary party does not exist separately and unrelated to the living struggle, to the class balance of forces. We're part of it. We're not a separate thing. Mm. So look at the history of the Bolsheviks to go back to that. They could not have led a successful struggle for power in February 1917. It wouldn't have been possible because of the consciousness, the understanding of the working class at that stage. Now, saying that's not blaming the working class, mm. but it was an objective fact, an accurate assessment of the stage of the class struggle 
to use a little bit of a cliche, but not mistaking the first month of pregnancy for the ninth, Mm. being able to tell the difference is essential for any serious revolutionary party. So when Lenin came back in 1917, in April, by the way, the reason they were all in exile was because of the dictatorship that existed and they weren't able to come back without just being thrown in prison prior to the eruption of the revolution and then they all raced back. But when Lenin gets back, he doesn't say, now the Bolshevik party is going to just take power. Mm. They intervene in the debate in the Soviets that was taking place. Mm -hmm. And at that stage, the leadership of the Soviets were in favour of just supporting a capitalist government in reality. But Lenin's position, he says, we're not charlatans. We must base ourselves on the consciousness of the masses. Even if it is necessary to be in a minority, so be it. It is a good thing to give up for a time the position of leadership. We must not be afraid to be in a minority. And he says, the real government is the Soviet of workers' deputies. In the Soviet, our party is a minority. What can we do? All we can do is explain patiently and insistently and systematically the error of their tactics. So long as we're in a minority, we will carry on this work of criticism in order to free the masses from deceit. We do not want the masses to believe us on our say-so. We are not charlatans. We want the masses to be freed by experience from their mistakes. And that is a fantastic summing up of the role of a revolutionary party intervening there in a revolution Mm. that you take part in the mass democratic organisations of the working class and you put forward what is necessary, understanding that it will be a combination of workers' own experience and your intervention, which will change consciousness and understanding. And at every stage, the Bolsheviks put forward demands that connected to the existing consciousness of the working class, but pointed towards the necessity of the working class seizing power. So at every stage, they pushed in that direction. And as a result of that, the working class did develop their consciousness, their understanding developed enormously, and they led a struggle for power successfully in October. Now, that's during a revolution Mm. where the working class have entered the scene of history. Obviously, not every situation is revolutionary. Mm even in a period like now, where capitalism is in an enormous crisis worldwide, where there's enormous discontent with the existing order, each country has its own rhythm of events. And there can be countries where there have been revolutionary movements, but they've been defeated, where there is no mood to struggle. And that happened after 1905, by the way. And in that situation, all the revolutionary party can do is hold itself together and prepare for the next phase. Globally, what is the situation now, worldwide, This is very broad brushstroke if you're going to talk about the whole world. Britain and the Lebanon are clearly not in exactly the same position right now. But even before the current economic downturn and its accompanying mass unemployment, impoverishment and so on, we saw in the wake of the 2008 economic crisis mass movements and revolutions developing. And the CWI predicted that. And particularly in the Middle East and North Africa, there was a revolutionary wave. As workers, the sickness of the capitalist system, the misery it meant for them, forced them into action. And we understood that would take place. There would be leaps forward in the consciousness of the masses on the basis of their experience of capitalist misery. And that wasn't just in the countries where there was a revolutionary wave. Mm. Even in Britain... Corbyn was actually right when he said Corbynism was history catching up with the 2007-2008 economic crisis. Mm. Partially catching up would be more accurate, but he was right. The support for Corbyn was a reflection of people's anger and radicalisation following that economic crisis. And that's also true about Syriza in Greece, Podemos in Spain, Sanders, the individual in the US. There's been a whole host of people looking towards left and socialist ideas on the wake of the previous economic crisis. Now there's a new one and there will be new revolutionary waves. Look at the Lebanon and what's taking place at the moment. And they will stand on the shoulders generally of what came before, having learnt some of the lessons of the previous decade. But still, it's a complicated period. I think broadly we would say that the setbacks of the period before the economic crisis of 2008, have not been fully overcome. You had the collapse of Stalinism and the restoration of capitalism in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, and that was a defeat for the working class internationally. They were not, I mean, you'll have a whole podcast about this, (laughs) they were not genuine socialism at all. They were brutal dictatorships. 
but they were nonetheless based on a very distorted form of a planned economy. And their implosion enabled a worldwide capitalist offensive against the working class. And under the impact of that, younger listeners will not really remember, but there was a period where nobody but us talked about socialism. Mm. It was accepted popularly that capitalism was the only option. There was no other way of running the world. Nationalisation, socialist planning, those things were widely discredited. And in that period, what had previously been traditional workers' parties either collapsed or were transformed into openly capitalist parties. We have Tony Blair as the example of what took place with Labour in Britain, where their leaders, who previously would have paid lip service to socialism while in practice carrying out capitalist policies in power, no longer paid any lip service to it. Mm. They supported the market. And levels of independent working class organisation, primarily political organisation, but also trade union organisation, were forced back in those years. Now, we pointed out that while that was a big defeat, the objective strength of the working class was still there, and that capitalism was a system in crisis that would only offer increasingly instability, war, mass unemployment, and that would lead to a new generation drawing socialist conclusions. And that's what's taken place. Mm. But we still haven't fully overcome what came before. We will. Mm. So look back to that revolutionary wave, the Arab revolutions and the North African revolutions back in 2011. Really, there were in general no mass parties of the working class. Obviously, we would have wanted a mass revolutionary party. Sure. And that's a party with a clear programme of the necessity of overthrowing capitalism and an idea of how to do it based on the role of the working class and so on. Any mass workers' party where workers broadly wanted socialism, even if they didn't fully understand how to get it and came together to discuss and debate, that didn't exist. Never mind something on a higher level. There were opportunities. In Tunisia, for example, there was the UGTT, which was a trade union federation with a history of some independence from the dictatorship, Mm -hmm. which, if its leadership had not succumbed to the post-Stalinist era, had put forward clear socialist ideas, potentially could have organised a mass movement of the working class during the revolution and cohered that, but that didn't take place. Mm -hmm. So there were no mass organisations of the working class to speak of during that revolutionary period. If you read Trotsky in the Transitional Programme, in its opening lines, he declares that the world political situation is chiefly characterised by a historical crisis of the leadership of the proletariat, so the leaders of the mass workers' parties. So is it therefore just the situation that, as in the Arab Spring, as with Jeremy Mm. Corbyn, you might argue, it was a deficiency of the leadership that meant a revolutionary party, a mass revolutionary movement, didn't develop in that way? It was absolutely a deficiency of the leadership. You know, the leaders were hopeless, but it goes beyond that. Okay. Because it was an absence of mass organisation. So Peter Taff, the previous General Secretary of the Socialist Party, now the Political Secretary... He wrote an introduction to the transitional programme back in 2010, Mm -hmm. prior to the Arab Spring. And in that, he explained, today it's not just a crisis of leadership we face, but also of organisation or of a lack of it. The working class doesn't have a clear organisation or programme. And that's the situation that we faced in the last period, which has only just begun. The first fumbling steps have been taken towards overcoming it. So in the early 20th century, by contrast, you did have mass workers' parties, you had mass trade unions, it wasn't automatic that those just popped into existence, those developed through struggles as well, but that's all been set back by this ideological counter-offensive following the collapse of Stalinism. I mean, you mentioned, by the way, this long period when even mentioning the word socialism, this was not done outside of a small select Mm. group of parties and individuals, including the Socialist Party. I remember I joined the Socialist Party at the start of 2009, so that was during the Great Recession following the financial crisis. And that was the case then. It's not that long ago. It's only a decade ago that people were still not experiencing even the language of socialism in the public arena. Exactly. And it was a different situation. This isn't like a simple, the past was good and now is bad at all. It's more complicated than that. Because... There were mass communist parties in some countries, mass social democratic parties, with the support of millions of workers in some cases, certainly hundreds of thousands, but their leaders betrayed revolutions again and again and again. And if you like the history of the 20th century, 
Look at France, 1968, the greatest general strike in history thrown away by the French Communist Party. Mm. The history of the 20th century was a history of the leaders of these mass formations betraying the working class. But them being swept away doesn't therefore mean that things are better because they haven't been replaced with anything yet or Mm. are only just beginning to be. And it's not a step forward for people to be sitting at home in their living rooms thinking there's no party that they can support, that capitalism's the only alternative on offer. Mm. Potentially, of course, we can get far better parties formed in the next period. And that's what we're fighting for. But we're not quite there yet. And actually, if you look at the last decade, Syriza in Greece, Podemos now in government in Spain, Corbynism, in different ways, they were all very tentative first beginnings of trying to create new mass workers parties. They when they've got to government, most clearly in the case of Syriza, absolutely betrayed the working class. But they also had very limited active involvement of the working class. They weren't workers' parties in that sense. We could have had one coming out of Labour if Corbyn had fought for it, but that's not what took place in reality. And of course, Corbynism has now been defeated. So they were quite ephemeral, limited formations, limited programmatically in terms of what they stood for, but above all, in terms of the mass participation of sections of the working class in those parties. So that's still a task ahead. But we think such parties can come into existence and potentially very quickly. And of course, that's what we fight for, for the existence of mass parties of the working class. We're not under any illusion that what you're going to see in the next period are stable, long term mass formations that exist for decades, as was the case for large chunks of the 20th century. We're in a different world today. Capitalism is in severe crisis And it's likely that new formations can be tested very quickly. And if their leaders capitulate to the demands of the capitalist class in a situation of mass unemployment and so on, can quickly be shattered and go out of existence again. Mm. But in a sense, that's not the issue for us. The issue is that in a mass workers' party, there is an element of a workers' parliament, that workers come together to discuss and debate. How can we transform society? What are the alternatives? How can we win better living conditions? Do we just need to nationalise 20 industries or the whole lot, etc.? And they're an important tool towards the development of a mass revolutionary party, which is the kind of mass workers' party that we really need in order to transform society. And it is a bit of an indication of still the limits of consciousness today that they have not yet developed, but they will in the course of the struggles that are coming. The other point I should just make Mm. is, of course, revolutions breaking out are not dependent on the existence of mass broad workers' parties beforehand. And potentially, mass workers' organisation can develop very quickly in the course of a revolutionary struggle. After all, Soviets, or workers' committees as they were called in other countries, wouldn't develop on a mass way outside of a revolutionary period, but developed in the course of revolutions. So, given that you've explained that it was only the pre-existing Bolshevik party, Mm -hmm. that Lenin had laid the groundwork before the events of 1917, if a working class, if the masses in a particular country suddenly face a situation where it's possible they might even take power... But there is no such organ for them to, as you put it, consolidate and hold on to power. Well, what happens then? That's the problem, isn't it? Then you go down to defeat in reality. Look, you can't rule out, particularly in neo-colonial countries where capitalism is very weak, that the scale of a mass movement is able to overturn the existing order, even without the pre-existence of a mass revolutionary party, In doing that, it would throw up its own mass organisations and it is an indication of the limits of those revolutions a decade ago that that didn't fully happen. Mm. People like Paul Mason here in Britain hailed it. Oh, it's the new horizontal revolution. You can just do it all on mobile phones. You don't need to be (laughs) organised. But of course, that just guarantees defeat. (laughs) Um, I may be paraphrasing Paul Mason slightly, but that was the essence of his position. Yes, it was. Um, So organisation can be thrown up in the course of a struggle. But... To succeed then in consolidating power, to stop the capitalist class coming back, to resurging, to crushing the revolution that has taken place, you need a revolutionary party with a clear idea. And if you look at Russia in 1917, the Soviets would have developed anyway. Mm. 
But the Soviets only posed the question of power. They didn't solve it. You needed the Bolsheviks with a clear idea of what was necessary, arguing their programme within the Soviets to succeed in overthrowing capitalism and then consolidating and beginning to build a new society, which requires mass democratic organisation, doesn't it? Mm. You're going to have a socialist planned economy based on workers' democracy. You have to be organised in order to achieve that. The Soviets created the tool to do that, but you needed the Bolsheviks with a clear idea of where they were heading. So as always, if you like what you've heard, recommend us to your co-workers and friends, donate to help fund us, and if you agree, join the Socialists. Thank you very much, Hannah. No problem. Socialism is produced by the Socialist Party, the England and Wales section of the Committee for a Workers' International. Today we heard from Hannah Sell, and I'm James Ivins. This episode was edited by Nick Hart. CWI is holding an international online rally for the 80th anniversary of Trotsky's assassination, entitled Why Couldn't His Ideas Be Killed? It's on Sunday the 23rd of August from 2pm London time. You can register to attend at socialistworld.net. You can find further reading on this episode in the notes in your podcast app and at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash podcast. If you want to get in touch, email socialismpodcast at socialistparty.org.uk. Do you agree with the policies and actions the Socialist Party is fighting for? We need you. Send us your details at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash join. If you live outside England and Wales and want to join the fight for socialism in your country, contact the Committee for a Workers' International by visiting socialistworld.net. Socialism, the podcast, has no wealthy backers. We rely only on funding from the working class, which maintains our political independence. So help us take the fight to big business. You can make a regular donation or a one-off payment at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash donate. Till next time, solidarity.